Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, Tom Tomers. Is that what we call you? And, and um, I'm so happy to be here in Charlottesville um, with all of you. So thanks for coming. Um, OK. I have a screen, kind of get myself oriented. Thanks here. OK. So I'm going to show Back you in this. 1991, people thought we were crazy to quit our day jobs and open New Belgium Brewing. They said Fat Tire was a weird name for a beer. And being 100% employee owned and environmentally conscious would never work. The world is full of people who like to say, you can't do that. And for all of them out there, we have one thing to say. Fat Tire Ale from New Belgium Brewing. I like to show that because it really is the story of New Belgium. All of the people in that video are my coworkers and the music was created by them. The, the short was filmed by a guy named Stacy Peralta, who also did Lords of Dogtown and Z-Boys, and his thing is um, subcultures of people. So we hired him to do this filming for us, and it turned out he stayed for 10 days because he was so intrigued by the subculture that is New Belgium that he wanted to learn a lot more about it. Um, we were born on a bike seat, as Michael alluded to. Uh, my then husband, Jeff Liebisch, uh, went on a mountain bike trip in Europe. At that time, a the nickname for a mountain bike was a fat tire bike, and he spent time in many countries, but he ended up in Belgium, and um, we decided that we would specialize in Belgian-style beers. There was no one in the United States doing that. Um, so beer is to Belgium what wine is to France. It's very regionalized and specialized, and they take a great deal of pride in their brewing heritage. Dr. Slaughter mentioned early on in her talk that she is um, of Belgian heritage. Her mother is Belgian. And, um, you know, she, we met backstage, and the first thing she said was, you know, I love beer, I love craft brewers. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm part Belgian. And I knew when I heard her say that, of course, that um, when she was up here speaking, that we would have that opportunity to talk about beer because beer and Belgians just go together. So we were the first uh, brewery in the United States to specialize in um, brewing Belgian styles. And it was a way to sort of bring that to the United States. Um, that's our creation story. I want to talk now about what inspires us. At New Belgium, we call it business role model. Um, so it's really, the, and that's our shorthand, but it's really the triple bottom line. Um, we believe that business can be a force for good, and that's really what motivates us to do a lot of what we do. Um, so, that is a function of people, planet, and profits. And when you think about that, and you kind of cast your mind back over the last 25 years or so, there is that natural connection. People like Gary Erickson at Cliff Bar, Yvonne and Melinda Schwinard at Patagonia, us at New Belgium, the people at Stonyfield Farms, companies that were founded by people who were raised in the 60s and 70s had this incredible opportunity and decided, you know, in order to kind of take their values and live them congruently with their business, that they were really going to think differently about the role of business. And at New Belgium, we believe that you need to have profits because you can be as groovy as you want to be, but if you can't keep the doors open, none of that matters. So profits are really the ultimate form of sustainability. But you also have this opportunity to make sure that you're accounting for your externalities, uh, you know, for your footprint with carbon or water or uh, the impact you have on employing people in a community, the impact you can have in a community. So, um, we really sort of have set the company up over all of these years to be able to do that, and I'll talk more about that. Um, 
as Michael mentioned, I was a social worker by training. Uh, my then husband was an electrical engineer, so it was a really great skill set match because there wasn't much overlap there. Before we ever made a barrel of beer, we went on a hike in Rocky Mountain National Park because I said it's really important to me that we codify what we want this baby company to be. So we came up with four things. We were going to produce world-class beer, promote beer culture. This is in 1991, when beer was primarily still kind of portrayed as the drink of the knucklehead. You know, it really was not something that was sophisticated with glassware and, and the kinds of flavor and reverence and matching with food that we see with beer now. We also, because it was consistent with who we were, wanted to be environmental stewards and we wanted to have fun. But then we remembered like, oh, we don't have anything about coworkers, our customers in there, because at that point we didn't have either of those things. And we realized later we needed to go back with our coworkers through a retreat and really flesh out who it was we were going to be. One of the things I've learned along the way is that language matters and having a system for how you express why you exist, what it is you're going to do, and how, it, how you're going to behave as you do it. If you have one language for that and everyone knows, you know, this is our purpose, this is our mission, these are our core values, you get alignment that's extremely powerful. So our purpose, um, is listed here, and we put love and talent first because we feel like um, the world needs more people who are attending to love. We spend a lot of time in this thing that we call work, and if it doesn't feel like the people you work with love you, and they have your back, and they care about you know, the outcomes for you at work, we think that's a real shame. So, um, and we also expect people to do their very best work, and we believe in always trying to make sure that we're improving and, and looking at things differently and with kind of a new sense of it. So that's one of the things that um, I've learned over all of these years, is that when you codify what you stand for, um, you get this alignment and you get a compass for all of your coworkers to really participate in. These are my coworkers. We have um, a retreat every year, so there are more than 800 of us now. We get everyone together. You're expected to be there. We are masters of the clipboard because we almost always have it outside. We have a lot of people who are trained to be facilitators, and they kick off the strategic planning process every year. All of my coworkers know where all of the money goes. They know what the strategy is. They can access it on our mother net, our internal um, web, any time that they want. Um, we go over the financials every month. We go over the strategy every quarter. Um, they are extremely involved and aware of the business of running the business. I'm going to talk now for a bit about our environmental practice. This is our energy, this is our energy period, uh, pyramid, essentially. Obviously, conservation is the low-hanging fruit. I don't know if any of you were at the energy innovation uh, afternoon yesterday, but I found myself geeking out on uh, the solar and biogas because we do those kinds of things at New Belgium as well. So it starts with conservation. We work with CSU, Colorado State University, um, the city of Fort Collins, the Department of Energy, and a private organization called, a private business called Spure on demand management. We live very close to a sub, or we work very close to us, I feel like I live there, to a substation at New Belgium. We have a lot of on site renewable energy. We're a big energy user, and so we work on, Fort Collins is really well known for smart grid management. So we've worked with these organizations to help them understand how do you pull energy on and off the grid in a way that works for everyone. It's a bit geeky, um, and the reason that we do it 
is that we can help them to understand smart grid management and sort of move the body of knowledge and awareness of how this is done forward. I'll show you some pictures of our generation. And then the last thing is our energy tax. We used to be involved in a wind power program in our town. And it switched to um, renewable energy credits, which are sort of questionable in their efficacy if we're trying to move toward a, a bigger portfolio of renewable energy in the United States. So we decided that we would take that incremental difference in the cost of the tax, and we would use it as an internal energy tax, where every year we um, invest in more on-site renewables. I'll, get, I'll, I'll circle back to um, some of the energy things in a bit, but I want to talk about something else that's important to me. This is uh, what we call Brew House One, and that is um, a heat exchanger. Came from Ace Hardware, cost probably $6.99 or so. Inside of that galvanized trash can is a copper um, a, a copper tube that the energy from the brew goes up through that copper and it uh, we use that for heating the water for the next brew. This brew house was our very first one. It was in the basement of our house, which is where we started New Belgium. This is brew house two in Fort Collins. We have breweries in Fort Collins and in Asheville. Um, that is the same concept, only it costs a million dollars. Um, so, you know, but, but the point of, of me showing you that is that we said we wanted to be environmental stewards. And I take that kind of thing really seriously. We're leaders. We say that we want to do things. Well, I showed you the energy pyramid, that we want to do things to make sure that we're doing that. So whether it's in the brand new beginning of our business when we use an Ace Hardware trash can or a million dollars of heat exchanger, um, we try to make sure that who we say we want to be and how we use our profits to invest in things are a really congruent process. This is our um, anaerobic digester. We have a processed water treatment plant, so all of the water we use for making beer goes in through an anaerobic, anaerobic phase to um, <coughs> create methane gas. We capture that gas in these bubbles here and we ship it back to the brewery and we have a combined heat and power plant where we turn that into thermal and electrical energy. This is where I was geeking out yesterday on, uh, there was some discussion about thermal energy. Um, again, you know, ways that we invest money. We have the largest private solar array in Colorado. This is all part of our internal uh, energy tax that we tax ourselves. I want to talk now a bit about Asheville. We have a brewery down there. It opened about a year ago. I'm trying to go fast in case it looks to you like I'm trying to go fast because I want to make sure that I don't go over my time here. Um, this is the brewery. This is some rendition and then some actual what it looks like. Uh, we're pretty excited to be in Asheville. It's just down the road from you guys. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by and see us. This is what that site looked like in the 60s. So it was a federal brownfield site, which we liked. We did a lot of remediation. We cleaned up stacks and stacks and stacks of tires and uh, washers and dryers and cars and uh, crushed a bunch of concrete. Um, we deconstructed, there was, on the site, there was a cattle barn. We deconstructed that and we used it for um, the wood, both inside and out in the brewery. So that was a really fun process. We used a lot of the street art. Let's see, I think I just went, we used a lot of the street art to um, inside the brewery. This is um, one of the pieces here and it's part of the lab. So it's just a fun way for us to take a site that was um, really downtrodden and uh, remediate some of the toxic issues with it. And it also allowed us to um, situate the brewery. Now it's, now it's doing that thing they sometimes do where it runs itself. Um, it allowed us to 
situate the brewery in the community of Asheville. So our coworkers can walk to work. We give them passes to uh, use the bus system whenever they want, not just for work, but always. They can bike to work. It's a hilly city, but it's uh, entirely possible. And um, that for us was absolutely essential. Fort Collins is the same way. And we think that um, it's important for communities to look at that interface between working life and living life. Um, at, we have a family foundation, and one of the things that we fund there is livable, bikeable, walkable communities. Because just like offshore um, wind power, or uh, yesterday they were talking about wind power in Spain, you know, we need to kind of understand that all of these things that we're doing, even if you can see the turbines and the monopoles, that's a part of our life. And we need to sort of get, I, my belief, we need to get comfortable with that notion that we are building a bigger portfolio of renewable energy, and that's going to have a look, and we're going to be okay with that, and we're going to celebrate that, that uh, interplay between those two aspects of our lives. We also took the opportunity in Asheville to... Um, kind of have some PSAs, if you will, on the backs of our trucks. Asheville is a lovely town where sidewalks were uh, clearly an afterthought or non-existent. And the notion of being a pedestrian or a cyclist is still very, very new there. And so it's rather dangerous. Um, and so, uh, moved again. Um, and so, we wanted to kind of raise the public awareness about um, cycling. So I'm gonna talk now about advocacy. We went along for a number of years doing what we did and being sort of excited about that internally, but we didn't talk about it very much and what, what we decided is we were making a splash. Um, and we realized that while our practice made a splash, we were really ignoring the power we had to um, take advantage of the ripple that comes with that. So we decided we were going to start making ripple or we were going to utilize the ripple. The first thing we did was to um, create a sustainability management system. So we gathered people from across the company and began to measure, rather than kind of ad hoc do whatever we wanted to do, we began to measure what our impact was. We also did an analysis of a six pack of fat tires so that we had the carbon footprint. Both of those things we published online so that anyone could come to our website and understand the impact that we were making on the planet and, and you know, also look at what we were planning to do about that. Um, I'm on a geeky board in San Francisco called um, the Advanced Energy Economy. It's businesses who are interested in energy. And part of the reason that I do that is because I'm really interested in it. But part of it is that I think there are a lot of businesses who understand if they're heavy energy users, their balance sheets are a little bit wonky because they're really not um, taking into account the risks of energy insecurity that we have in the world these days. And so I wanted to be sure that I was a part of that conversation. So we did our um, natural resources group put together our sustainability management system. We measure all of, the, all of our water and energy intensity. <clears throat> we moved into advocacy after that, so we support the clean power plan. We, you know, that may be a moot point for now, but I'm sure we'll get back to it. And as was said yesterday, cities, businesses, communities, states are moving along, even if the federal government is taking a pause, um, because we think these are important issues. Um, and we started doing some sort of branding. We, at the time, we had a beer called Skinny Dip, and so we started doing some branding around um, healthy watersheds and saving rivers. We worked with groups like Ben and & Jerry's, this is when, and with a nonprofit called POW, Protect Our Winners, again, to kind of use beer, and in this case, ice cream, to raise awareness for issues. 
Uh, we've signed on with other brewers. Um, uh, Dr. Slaughter mentioned the power of breweries as craft. They also have power in this sense as well. Um, and then we also make sure that we participate in hosting um, thought leadership uh, sessions to be able to talk with other businesses about what we're going to do and to invest in salmon safe hops. I'm, I'm moving through those. I'm going to talk about people a little bit now and also about B Corp. I don't know how many of you are familiar with B Corp. Um, very quickly, uh, the elegant thing about B Corp is that it allows board of di directors and boards of directors to um, really look at a broader scope of issues when they're thinking, not just looking at their fiduciary responsibility, but to also look at their responsibility to a wide variety of stakeholders, communities, their coworkers, their customers. Um, and you need to do a B impact report every other year. Um, and so we've been doing that since 2013. And there are, I believe, um, is it 200 points? Yeah, there are 200 points. The average uh, that people get is 55. And we got 142. So we feel pretty um, enthusiastic. <laughs> about the work that we do there. Um, and you know, what I have learned from this is that you have this, you go into business, you're a founder, all of you were thinking about founding things, and you get to think about who do we want to be? Who do we want this baby company to be? What's going to matter to us? How does our, you know, our own personal ethos uh, play out inside of this business. And for me, it's been, you know, the most delightful surprise that we can make choices to do really powerful work. And my coworkers who are here today, sitting over here, can really raise the flag and say, what are we doing about this? And we want to make choices to do that, whatever it is in any situation, because they own 100% of the company. We started out, um, Jeff and I gave our coworkers 10%. Then, um, uh, ESOPs came along for S corporations, which is what we are. So we sold them another 22. And then it, at the end of 2012, my sons and I and our management team sold the balance of the company to um, the ESOP. So we're 100% employee owned. So whose job is it? It's everyone's job. Everyone uh, gets financial training when they start working at New Belgium because it's hard to participate in the business of the business if you're not financially literate. So we talk about, you know, how you read a balance sheet, what the cash flow statement does, how the P&L is really the driver of day-to-day -day business. We um, use the great game of business by Jack Stack, which he's kind of the father of the open book management movement. Um, and that leaves us with what's ours is ours. And it's really been, in some ways, because we had, have worked for so long as a high involvement culture with a business role model platform, um, it was very natural for us to go to 100%. In some ways, it was um, that nothing changed. And in other ways, it was that everything changed. So um, it's been really exciting for us. The last, I have two more points I want to make, and I'll zip through them here. One is one of the other exciting parts of, of building a business is understanding that you can create fertile ground for people that you come to know and love to really um, bloom and, and find their place in the world. This is a woman named Lauren Salazar. Actually, she her last name now is... Limbach, Lauren Limbach, she just recently got married. Um, and she started out as an administrative assistant at New Belgium, and then she developed our world-class um, uh, sensory program at the brewery. 
And she is also a world-class wood-aged beer blender. And so, you know, from someone who started making sure that people went to the right meetings when they were supposed to, she's considered one of the most knowledgeable wood beer blenders in the world. And also one of the most knowledgeable sensory people in the world. We never want to lose sight of our craft. We have a huge wood beer cellar, and we always want to make sure that, you know, first and foremost at New Belgium, we're brewers, and we are lucky to be carrying on the ancient craft of brewing beer. And then this is the last one here. Um, I'm a huge fan of ceremony and ritual. We make sure that our coworkers um, have opportunities to get together several times a year through ownership, through our retreat process, through our um, monthly all staff meetings to eat food, drink beer, celebrate, be together. And, um, and in some of those cases, really make sure that we have almost sacred moments you know, to really sort of stop and remember what's important to us. Um, because I think that's how you build a rich sense of your future. I'm going to blast through the last of it. I'll, actually, I want to tell this story. This is the last one for reals. This is Say Yes. Uh, this, we uh, have an ownership ceremony twice a year, and it got to the point, we now have it once a year, got to the point where the hugging was taking much longer, we're big huggers at New Belgium, was taking much longer than the actual ceremony. And so um, somebody developed this Tony Danza with the very long arms. <laughs> why Tony Danza? Hold me closer, Tony Danza is why. <laughs> Makes as much sense to you as it does to me. But as a leader, one of the things that you learn is that you don't have to understand everything, and sometimes it's just good to get out of the way and let people sort of express their human creative potential. So on behalf of all of my coworkers and my coworkers here today, um, thank you so much for your uh, attention and um, enthusiasm for New Belgium, and I think we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A session here. So thanks so much.